All right, how's it going, y'all? You're watching The Green Dream Project. Jim here. And Jessica. And we're here today to talk about rainwater harvesting. Is it illegal? We're gonna talk about that and other common misconceptions and myths you might have heard about rainwater harvesting, how to do it right, what to do, and what not to do exactly. I think one of the biggest things I keep hearing about how rainwater harvesting is illegal. That's furthest from the truth. In fact, most places around the US, rainwater harvesting is completely legal and in a lot of places encouraged. For those of you that live in the US, the Energy Department actually has a map on their website. You can go and check all the different states and see what all the regulations are about rainwater harvesting. For instance, I checked out Arizona where we live and there are no restrictions on rainwater harvesting there. In Colorado, you can see that for residences, you can have like 100, just a little over 100 gallons of rainwater storage that you can use for like irrigation and outdoor use. And actually, if you have a well, you can have an unlimited amount that you can use for whatever, indoor, outdoor uses. That seems like a really great resource. It has links to the different laws if you wanna check out the laws in, in your state. It has links to the specific state departments that might deal with rainwater harvesting if you want more information. So that's something that you might wanna check out if you have questions about is it legal? Are there any regulations or restrictions on that? Most places in the U.S. it allows you to harvest the rain and it is a possible great resource. I know some of the cities in Arizona like Tucson for example actually encourage rainwater harvesting and they might offer rebates for any kind of rainwater harvesting systems and kind of rebate the cost of that. So check in your area because not only might you not get penalized but you they might be encouraged to harvest the rain so definitely look for incentives what's the next myth busted another thing people wonder often is is it actually possible to live off of rainwater easy yes yes <laughs> i mean we've been doing that for several years now but i mean we're not the only ones clearly there are plenty of other people doing it there are many people who have done it in the past successfully totally doable even in the desert like we're doing. <laughs> actually when we were first thinking of moving off grid and doing rainwater harvesting i was asking that question like could we actually collect rainwater in the desert and live off of that or would we need a well or some other source of water and one of the big inspirations for me personally was a man named Zephaniah Firi Maseko from Zimbabwe. And he lived in one of the most arid regions in Southern Africa. And he successfully lived on rainwater for over 40 years, farming and providing for his family and developing techniques to live sustainably on rainwater. You know, check out uh, Brad Lancaster. Brad Lancaster was actually inspired by this gentleman as well. Brad Lancaster lives in Tucson. Which is even drier than here. Mm -hmm. And again, he's another person that lives on rainwater and in the city. Yep. So it's, it's just a matter of learning some techniques that you can use if you live in a dry climate or whatever climate you live in and what, what's appropriate for that climate planning your system accordingly for the environment and for your own needs. When you're thinking about actually designing a rainwater harvesting system and getting into that, a lot of people are wondering, what size storage tank do I need? What size of a you know, roof or catchment area do I need? And how do I get that all set up? Well, I would say the first thing you need to think about is how much water do you need and specifically how much water do you need for the longest period of of a dry spell that you need to get through so like for us here we have months that we don't get rain other 
areas, you know, it might be just weeks or something. That will give you the size of the tank that you need. So figure out how many gallons of water are you going to be using during that dry period and how much storage you need to get you through that period. Then you have to figure out how much of a surface area do you need to collect enough water. I take into consideration of this formula when collecting rainwater off of your surfaces. You get 0.62 gallons for every square foot of catchment you have for every one inch of rainfall. We get about 13 inches on average annually. So of course we have to have a much larger catchment and storage system than let's say someone in the Midwest where you might get over 30 inches annually. Yeah, as you can see, we have some large tanks. We have multiple tanks. We also have a very large roof that we catch that rain off of. And I would suggest oversizing your system uh, rather than undersizing it. Figure out what you need for that dry season and keep that in mind as like a bare minimum. You know, if you can have more, always oversize rather than undersize. And then if you can afford it, make it a little bit larger. Water is definitely something you don't want to run out of. And as far as setting up a system, people wonder what kind of materials do I use? Like what kind of a uh, roof is it safe to catch that water off of, especially if you're going to be, you know, drinking that water or something. I get that a lot. Uh, I think there's some confusion about what people can kind of sort of use as catchment surfaces. Really, you can almost use pretty much almost anything to catch rainwater off. Mm -hmm. As long as it's not something that's going to be leaching chemicals into your water, you probably want to avoid that. So keep in mind, some surfaces will be great for both like personal use, drinking, bathing, and irrigation. Some might be uh, better for irrigation and some might be better to not use for irrigation. Mm -hmm. So like your galvanized metal roof, um, there's a possibility that it could leach zinc into the water. So that's something to think about. If uh, Generally it's safe, but if you're concerned about that, you can test your water to see what those levels are. Some things you might want to avoid are maybe like wood shingles that have been treated with chemicals. A lot of wood shingles might, you know, have fire retardants on it or something like that. Some roofs are copper and copper might not be too bad to drink if there's a little bit in there but uh, it is a biocide. It could harm plants if you're planning on using that for irrigation. One thing that surprised me was about the asphalt. And apparently you can use like asphalt shingles or panels for collecting rainwater off. There's just a couple things you might want to consider about that. There could be some off-gassing and some of the adhesives used for that. But I think generally it is safe that off-gassing might occur. There might be a little bit of that in the first few years after it's installed. But I think it's generally considered okay. And of course anything like that might have lead in it. I think sometimes there's like lead flashing or something on, on roofing they that still, might still be used. Still gotta check around in the U.S. because some things still might contain lead so be, be careful with that. And if you're in doubt, you can test the water and see if there's any contaminants in that. Um, when in doubt, test it out. Yep, and there might even be some kind of coatings you can put on a roof to make it safer for drinking. And when it comes to tanks, people wonder, what do I have to do to prepare for a tank to make that safe so you know there aren't any problems with the tank? What kind of foundation does it need? How do you prepare that surface? Actually, from from one of the uh, people I've spoken to about what to set the tank on, they even just recommended plain dirt. They could even caution against gravel because you can have sharp rocks that could possibly damage the underside of the container. So if you do use gravel, you gotta make sure it's like a rounded gravel with no sharp edges, sort of like a pea gravel, right? Right. But we just have our set on just the dirt and clay in. We have never had any issues. So I think the usual options are sand, pea gravel, concrete, or just dirt. And I think the biggest considerations there would be 
like if it does rain or you have flooding or water runoff in that area where is the water running to is it going to affect that base is it going to wash anything away obviously if it's like loose dirt or sand even gravel that might shift and get washed away if there's a lot of water with concrete you obviously don't have to worry about things shifting too much or washing away or anything like that but you probably have to consider where the water again mm -hmm. is going to be and you want it to drain away from your tank. Yeah, concrete's going to be the most durable and the most stable one, but probably the most expensive. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously you got to weigh each of those on your own. One of the biggest things that gives people pause about rainwater harvesting is, is it safe to drink? Is it safe to collect and use? Yes, yes it is. <laughs> it can be. Of course, there are gonna be several factors going into that. Considering where you can get sources of water, I mean, maybe like natural spring water might be safest as far as drinking, like least contaminated, but all water has the potential of becoming contaminated with pathogens or chemicals or whatever that you might not want in there. And like groundwater certainly can become contaminated. City municipal water, anyone from Flint, Michigan can tell you that can become contaminated. There's just things that you have to keep in mind that can make rainwater harvesting perfectly safe for drinking or whatever purpose you wanna use it for. First of all, like air pollution, you might be thinking rain comes from the sky. What if the air is Polluted, is that going to affect the rain? And it can. It depends on where you live. That's a big factor and what kind of pollution there is there. And keep in mind too, like if you feel that the air pollution is such an issue where it can affect your drinking water, you definitely have to consider the fact that you're breathing that in. So it might be a bigger that might focus. be a bigger yeah, exactly. Once that rain falls, if you're doing rainwater harvesting, you have to think about the collection surface. It can pick up debris from a roof or whatever you're collecting it from. There might be like bird poop on there or dust. There's certain ways that you can design your system to minimize any health risks. You want to make sure any of your inlets are all screened so uh, no bugs or debris are getting into there. You can also set up a first flush system. A lot of people do that. It can be just a simple pipe or maybe even a small container before it gets to your main containers. Probably depending on, like if you live in the woods, you might get a lot more birds and debris than someone living in the desert. So you might want a larger first flush system. Basically what a first flush system does is just the very first rain that falls on your collection surface, it's gonna wash it off and take it somewhere else so it doesn't get stored in your tanks. And first flush water can always be used for irrigation. Now when it comes to the storage tanks, that's another thing to consider, how you set that up so that it makes it safe water. One thing people wonder about is algae growth or the water becoming stagnant. Now we personally, we use 90 degrees and we block off any light from getting into the containers that we use. But some places they actually let a little bit of algae growth in their containers because that can actually uh, kind of clean and purify the water as well. Some people might use that as like a biological filter, but there is a risk of certain algaes, you know, with uh, creating like toxins. I would err on the side of not doing it than doing it. But if you do it, you know, make sure you've studied and you know what you're doing before getting into something mm -hmm. like that. Another risk is if organic matter gets into your water in the storage tanks, it might promote the growth of bacteria or some other pathogen that you don't want in there. So you definitely want to avoid organic matter getting into your tanks. That's why screens are really important on any inlets. People also ask, should you be treating the water in your tanks with anything? Metals like silver, copper, that are biocides, or maybe bleach or other chemical treatments. Now we currently don't use any silver or copper in any of our containers, but I, 
I was thinking about maybe adding that to the cistern over here when we start using that for the house. But keep in mind that it can harm plants. So if you're gonna use that for irrigating, something to consider and definitely pay attention to how much you're using of any kind of additive. Make sure it's not too much so it becomes harmful. I mean, you can use chemicals, bleach, chlorine, or something like that, pool shocks. I think the nice thing about managing your own system is that you can use whatever you feel comfortable using. Obviously, you don't want to use too much, but you are in control of that. You can add in as little or as much as you want that you feel safe doing. That way you always know what is in your water and mm -hmm. you can kind of keep track of that. So now if you're going to be using rainwater for drinking, bathing, other household uses, should you have a filter for that? Uh, again, filtering is definitely something that you have to decide on what you're comfortable with, what your particular needs are, because I've seen people do rainwater harvesting and they use absolutely no filtration. And if you collect it right, you can absolutely do that. Yeah, it might depend again on your environment, what kind of possibilities of contamination there are, the setup of your system, how well is the water being cleaned or filtered going into your tanks. When we first came out here, we were only using the Berkey. We did eventually add an inline filter before it goes to the RV. So we personally use that inline filter so everything that's in the RV gets filtered a little bit through that. And then we use the Berkey for any drinking or cooking water. Mm -hmm. And the Berkey is a really high quality filtration. It's, and it's simple to use. No electricity or anything needed. It's all gravity. There's other ways of filtering water as well. I've seen there's like UV filters, reverse osmosis, there's lots of options. The next evolution I think would be like one of those three-step filtration processes that goes after the pump and then a UV filter if you uh, feel the need for that, reverse osmosis, exactly like she was saying. So it's all on your comfort level and what you want and you can keep upgrading or however you, whatever you Feel you need to be safer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just uh, do your research into the different filters and what all they can remove and what consider what you might need to remove from the water. Mm -hmm. Some people might want to test their water to see if it does have any contaminants in there. We've never tested our water. If you feel testing makes you feel safer, then do it. Again, if you feel confident in your area and the way you're collecting it, then there might not be a need for it. You do you, boo. Okay, I think another question is about maintaining a rainwater harvesting system. How difficult is it to maintain? And what all do you need to do? Do you have to clean out the tanks? A lot of that depends on probably the system you set up. I know a neighbor of ours, they do like an annual cleaning of their tanks. When it, go, when it gets low, they drain it, kind of clean it out. We personally have never done any kind of clean out of our uh, poly tanks or a cistern. Cause I mean, they're so large. So like there's not nearly as much sediment buildup to cause any issues with that. Now the IBC totes, uh, sometimes those fill up with debris a little quicker. I have had it where the, sometimes those might clog up. So in that case, yeah, you might have to clean out the debris and something small like that. But again, for our tanks, I've never had any issues with that. Probably depends a lot on the system you've designed. Yeah, the size you might have. You might have to check out like any of the sc screens that you're using. Make sure those are cleaned off nicely. Some people might have like a slope screen where much of the debris kind of like shunts off. Mm -hmm. So that might uh, kind of like lessen the maintenance you have to do. Depending on where you live, there might be some winterizing mm -hmm. you want to do. So yeah, uh, yeah, winterizing isn't something we have to worry too much about. Uh, any kind of like pipes or anything above ground will tend to freeze out here. But in some areas, you might get so cold where even a, if you have an IBC tote, that might completely freeze. Mm -hmm. Larger tanks probably won't freeze. That might affect how you design your system if you want an underground tank or something that's protected in some way. And one thing I would recommend when you do get your system set up is go out while it's raining and just observe the system and see how the water's running through it. Are there leaks? Anything that you can improve upon? Is it working well? Is the water going where it should? I'll tell you that is one of the biggest things that I like to do, uh, especially at the start of the rainy season. And it's always good even to just observe not only the 
rain catchment system but even if you have like a small property or a large property to see how that rain is falling on the ground and make those observations as well. Now we've been doing rainwater harvesting for a few years now. Maybe even longer. I mean, technically we started in the city. That's true. Uh, rainwater harvesting has been a, a passion of ours for a long time. Even before we moved out here, I've been doing so much research and reading on it. I love it. <laughs> so with all that research and experience, do you think there's anything we would do differently now? There could be a lot of things I would do differently, but uh, <laughs> the main thing, if I could do things differently from what we have set up here, if I could start over from scratch, it would be keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Not calling you stupid. Keep everything as simple as possible. And that could be said for any kind of system you develop. You know, if you can keep your catchment to your storage, to your point of use as short as possible, absolutely do that. Ultimately, the reason why things are the way they are right here is because we had plans when we initially moved out and then those plans changed. So it's not as efficient as it could be, but it still works pretty good. But it just could be a lot simpler. You know, the tanks could be right underneath the roof and then the house could be right outside of that. So, yeah. but it's not that big of a deal. Not ideal, but sometimes you gotta work with what you have. So, you know, if you're designing a system from scratch, make it as simple as humanly possible and that'll save you headaches and trouble down the road. Even take our cistern here, for example, you know, it's a very large cistern. And although we're grateful for the amount of water storage it can give us, I really think that having several smaller cisterns would be much more advantageous than one larger one. You could have it closer to your point of use. Uh, if something goes wrong with it, you have backup, just some things to consider. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, I know we probably didn't get to everyone's questions or comments or anything like that. We tried to get some of the biggest myths and questions and misconceptions that are out there. We hope this helped you. And uh, we hope this makes you feel a little bit more confident in starting your own rainwater harvesting. You know, uh, even if you're doing just a little bit, just to supplement your needs, it can be so beneficial. Yeah, I mean, we didn't even talk about all the benefits of rainwater harvesting. Yeah, even something small, just uh, for garden use or for watering animals. A lot of possibilities, and it can save on your water bill, make things more efficient out there where you live. And even if you get a lot of rain, that's a way to manage that water runoff so that it can go back out into <laughs> the environment in a less destructive way. So I know, I know another misconception that people have is like with rainwater harvesting, uh, I've, I've really heard a big thing that you're taking water out of the environment and it's not going into that natural flow of going into the groundwater. So you're disrupting that flow, you're taking it out of nature, you're taking away from the animals of nature and stuff like that, but that could not be further from the truth. Especially here in the desert where you get so much more evaporation than actual ground penetration. Uh, rainwater harvesting is so important. What you're really doing is you're slowing that water getting into the environment. You stop it from evaporating, you're using it, and just slowly easing it back into the environment. Even if everyone is rainwater harvesting, it's only gonna slow it and allow that water to get in there and penetrate rather than evaporate. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that is, that's another big misconception. Rainwater harvesting only helps the environment. It only helps groundwater. And it helps, helps plants and animals and people. So again, we are not certified experts or anything like that. We're just a couple of very passionate people. I tell you, uh, rainwater harvesting has been an obsession of mine for many years. And I've watched so many videos, read so many books, seminars. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I've been putting it into practice for years now. Yeah, I love it. I encourage anyone to do it. Even if you have already a water supply, it never hurts. I'm just honored to be able to get to share this passion of mine with you all. Hopefully this encourages you to do a little rainwater harvesting. I definitely recommend checking out uh, Brad Lancaster and his books if you're really interested in getting into rainwater harvesting. He has a lot of information on that. If you still have any questions or comments, leave those down below. This can be a community. People can help each other out if there are still more questions. And don't forget to check out our group on Facebook. Post any questions in there. It's a growing community. I think we almost got 6,000 members in there. So uh, definitely a lot of people that can help each other out. 
and get those questions that you need answered for rainwater harvesting, earth bag building, or any kind of permaculture homesteading needs. So excited as we get back into the dome build. I can't wait. All right, we'll catch you in the next video, everyone. Bye.